Well, at that time, I guess we better get started. It's just too much fun to visit with one another, though, isn't it? It's too much fun. And uh, it's especially good to have Beverly back this morning. Are you doing better, Beverly? Thank you, Lord. Excellent. And I was just talking to Calvin, and he said Jerry is doing better, but she's not patient. We know how that is, don't we? But it's going to take a while on that, and uh, so we want to remember her as we pray. We want to remember our friend Pat. Uh, what time is your surgery tomorrow, Pat? Well, uh, just going for consulting, I think, tomorrow at 10.30. Okay. Then I'll know when they're going to do surgery. Okay. So we want to continue with his uh, skin concerns that they have. Uh, Bill Pearson and Montez and Joan Parker and Phyllis and I went to Bowie to see Jim and Betty Johnson and had a wonderful time. And uh, they both looked good and we had lunch there at the facility with them and then we sang for the residents. And then we went back to the room and Betty wanted us to sing some more so we sang <laughs> some more and just had a great time. And we planned to go back so maybe if you'd like to go and any of you will take the big bus, you know, and go another time soon. And let's see, we want to continue to pray for Bob Tarpening. Let's continue to, to pray for him. Uh, yes, and for Jerry. Marjorie? Okay. Is he down in Houston? Were they affected by the flood? No. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Lee? And let's keep Sarah Maples is volunteer. Yes, for sure. Okay. So uh, we want to. Uh, Sarah's down volunteering uh, with down in Houston with a hurricane recovery. She, uh huh. She responded actually to the, the call for volunteers in church last Sunday. And she's going to be down there all this week helping out. So, and because she's bilingual, that will be really good, you know. So, uh, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin, and several things we want to, to mention. Father, your word tells us that part of our calling is to be still and know that you are God. Be still and know that you are God. I will be exalted among the nations, and Father, we want to stay to pause right now uh, as believers in Jesus Christ, as people who love and serve you, Lord, to acknowledge that you are uh, sovereign over all, Father, that you are, uh, you alone are holy, that we are totally dependent on you, and that you are so good, Father. Uh, we pray that uh, you would continue, Lord, to breathe your spirit on us. We see evidences throughout our church and throughout the body of Christ at large that, that in ways that you are responding to prayers that you would revive your church and we need that Lord because this is a time when uh, the days are dark and the light of Jesus Christ needs to be shown so Lord we honor you we uh, praise you and and thank you father we pray today for our nation Father, we just we just ask that you would uh, you might show mercy, Lord, in the midst of all of this tragedy. Uh, we don't second guess for a moment what it means, Lord. Uh, there's some who say would say it's strictly the uh, fact that we're in a fallen world. There were some there would be some, Lord, that would say it's the judgment of God. There are others who say it's the end times. We leave that all up to you, Lord, but whatever it is, we know what we're supposed to do. You said, Lord, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, if my people will do that, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. So, Lord, we commit, as this body of believers right here, we commit, Lord, to humble ourselves, seek your face, uh, turn from our wicked ways, and uh, we ask, Lord, that you would breathe new life into your church. And, Father, lay it on our hearts to pray every day for our world, for our nation, uh, not only for help, 
in the midst of physical needs, Lord, but for salvation to come to lost people, uh, Lord, for conviction. Uh, you've said that you will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and coming judgment. And you've also said that it's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. So, Lord, we pray that all of this would happen, Lord, over uh, people who need to come to you, that those who are in your body who need to be revived would be, and that includes all of us, but some that maybe, uh, maybe have turned away. Father, we pray today for our church. Thank you for uh, putting a burden on the heart of our pastor and our staff and others to, uh, to do what we can, Lord, in providing aid to those down in the, in the Houston area and below. Father, we, uh, we do pray for Sarah Maples this morning, one of our own. We pray, Lord, that you would just use her in a special way and that you would bless her, Lord, and her willingness to step out uh, when it's a little bit uncomfortable and but follow your leading. Lord, we want to pray for uh, health needs today. First of all, thank you that Beverly's back and doing better. Father, we pray for our friend Bob Tarpening for encouragement and for Patsy, uh, just for encouragement and that you would uh, place your healing hand on them. We pray, Lord, for uh, Pat as he goes in for consultation, that you would give the doctors wisdom and how to deal with that and that they could successfully do whatever they need to do. Thank you that Jerry Clayton is doing so much better. May she continue to progress. Thank you that you've eliminated a lot of the pain and that it looks like everything will be clear. Um, Lord, so many others that uh, are among our people who need that special touch. And uh, Father, we pray for Jim and Betty. Thank you for all that they mean to this uh, Travis family. Would you encourage them today? Lord, continue to bless them continue to place them on our hearts, Lord, as they're away from us, wishing they could be here uh, to stay in contact with them. Thank you for these that have gathered, Lord, who have come to love you, to love each other, and to worship you, and for Bill Shan as he leads us in worship this morning, and then for uh, Jim as he continues to speak to us about your Ten Commandments and how they relate to our lives. We commit all of this to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, it's good to have Bill back with us this morning, isn't it? I've got some, uh, I, I learned from Bill Pearson that we have so many choir singers in here. Why not utilize them? So uh, I'm going to follow your lead, Bill, and ask some of the people to come up here. And if you'll come up behind me and, and help me out this morning. <coughs> These are all uh, willing. No, they weren't willing. I had to almost break their arms to get them to come do this, but I appreciate this. Here's two more copies of the uh, police. We, we all have copies of this. That's great. All right. Uh, the first hymn is number 69 of uh, Old 4,000 Tongues to Sing. Uh, this is going to hit you in the face right here, man. <laughs> Uh, do, you, do you all have a copy of this? That's our uh, 69, everybody. Uh, I appreciate you ladies doing this. And, uh, now we're going to sing uh, two hymns, and then they'll join me in, in, uh, in a thing called Come Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, they'll sing with me on that as kind of a solo this morning. This is close enough, isn't it? I mean, you, you probably hear me too much right here. All right. Are you all ready to go? Oh, 4,000 tongues to sing. Uh, you have it? Here we go.
<laughs> I'm sorry, I messed you up. Uh, the, the theme of this uh, the solo and, and this song is the Holy Spirit Breathe on Me. It's 131. 131, everybody. And let's sing the first three stanzas and then we'll go into our, our <coughs> thing. <we sing. coughs> Here we go.
sitting here in front of the piano listening to Bill play and it reminded me that you might have seen a video after the Houston hurricane. It was a video of a, of a pastor at his home in the Houston area somewhere that the waters had come in and the water was up to just below the keyboard and he was sitting on a, his piano bench playing that piano and singing hymns. And I, I thought, that's a, that's a Christian for you. Yeah. It was wonderful. Well, this morning we're going to finish our series on the Ten Commandments and uh, we're going to do Commandment 9 and 10. And then I'm going to try to bring it all together with sort of my understanding of what place the Ten Commandments have today for New Testament Christians. And uh, by the way, I wanted to kind of tip you off. Uh, starting next week, I'm going to begin a new series uh, verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. And we're going to probably be in Hebrews up until right before Christmas, I'm thinking. It's a, it's a book that just, just really moved me recently several times, and, and uh, I've never gone through it verse by verse before, so I'm looking forward to it, and I hope to share with you what I, what I gleaned from it. Well, this morning, we're going to start with uh, the ninth commandment, Genesis, I mean, excuse me, Exodus, chapter 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, you remember I started this series, I said, our world we live in, a lot of times they'll tell you, you can't legislate morality. And I think I've shown to you, each of these commandments are part and parcel of our justice system in the western part of the civilization. Uh, you can legislate morality. There's not a question about it. When you start talking about you shall not murder, you shall not steal, uh, those are things that we live with laws every day in all of the European and United States laws. You can legislate morality in this one. Uh, is in effect today in many of our laws. Bearing false witness against someone is called what in the court system? It's called libel or slander. Uh, it's a lie. If you lie, uh, you can be prosecuted. Uh, to be a, a, a good witness, as a, perhaps a, a witness you've seen something take place and you're summoned as a witness to court, you take an oath that you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, that comes from this commandment, commandment by the Lord. It's a story, I mean, rather a commandment that tells us what God values in the society. And that is truth. When we talk to another person, God wants us to tell the truth. Now, there's a little uh, word that's not popular, a little sin that's uh, ill-spoken of. It's called gossip. Gossip is a, a word we all know what that means. That's bearing false witness about someone, 
Uh, and clearly, the New Testament teaches this commandment. This is one of the commandments that's very much in effect in the New Testament scriptures. It didn't go away. Uh, we are still to bear uh, the truth. Living a lie is what was in the heart of God when he gave this commandment. He did not want us to have a society, a church, or even a family that's based on lies. If you think about many of the things that are racking our world at this present time, there are ideologies that are based on lies. Early in the 19th and 20th centuries, it was communism. World War II was begun because of the lie of Nazism, <coughs> fascism. All these isms that we're confronted with today are based on lies. Thou shalt not bear false witness applies today. It's truth. Bad things happen when people tell lies. We have a society that's based on truth in our church. Here at Travis Avenue Baptist, it's based on truth. Our relationships with one another are based on truth. Telling lies breaks down the foundation not only of our families, but our churches and our societies at large. Now, the last commandment is very interesting. It's, it's really unique from the other nine. Uh, and it starts in verse 17. It says, God says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. I think God put that in there for us 21st century people. Because you're sitting there thinking, well, I have no ox, and I have no donkey, so this one doesn't apply. <laughs> well, friends, it does apply. And that's that little phrase, you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's, that's got you covered. We've got uh, a problem in our hearts. It's a heart problem that sometimes we want what other people have. It might be a material possession. Uh, it might be a, a spiritual gift. It might be a musical talent. <coughs> to covet, to want what someone else has is to covet. God outlaws it here. And when I said this one's different from the other nine, you know what's different about it? It's because this one is a heart problem. The others are external acts. When you go out and chisel out a statue and set up a graven image, that's something you do with your hands, right? When you commit murder, you do that outwardly. Steal is something you do outwardly. But this one, God is talking about your heart. He's talking about the private conversation that you have with yourself. Now, my mama always told me it was okay to talk to myself, but if I ever got to where I was going to answer myself, I needed to come tell her. Uh, because then we would have a problem. And I believe my mama's right. This commandment, God is saying to all people, don't, in the conversation you have in your heart with yourself, ever covet what somebody else has. Don't, don't do that. Uh, be satisfied. Be content with what you have. Uh, without getting into politics, uh, if I could call to mind when uh, FBI Director James Comey gave that announcement back during the election time that he had investigated Hillary Clinton, and uh, although she had done many wrong things, he didn't see that she intended to use that word. She didn't intend to do that. And so he dismissed all charges against her, right? Well, the unfortunate thing is, intent is not a part of the law. Uh, the judge, when you go before a judge, is not going to question your intent. You know, we like to say, well, I, was, I, I didn't mean to, or I was, I, sincerely, I didn't mean that that should happen. That's not important. If you break the law, you break the law. And she did, and he didn't do anything about it. And this is what this commandment is about. 
in your heart, God says, don't covet what somebody else has got. It's theirs. Uh, it's really the basis, if I could say this, in our society for private property. It's an implicit statement from God that lays out there for you to accept it or not that what other people have is theirs. It's not yours. And you're not to take it or, or scheme or plot or figure out a way that you can take it. You, know, you see? Be content with such things as you have. You know the interesting thing, this word in Hebrew, the definition for this word, I found amusing. It means to pant over. Have you ever had your dog go out walking and get too hot and come back inside? His tongue's hanging out of his mouth and he's just panting and panting trying to trying to get cooled down. That's what this word means. God is looking at people and saying, you're sitting there with your tongue hanging out of your mouth, breathing heavy and panting after what somebody else has got that you don't have. Don't do that. Don't do that. Hebrews 13.5 said it. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I find it interesting that God's answer to, to coveting is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, he could have said all sorts of things that you can do when you're feeling that urge to covet what he's got or what she's got. And God says what you need is the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. You need to stop what you're doing and turn to him and call on his name. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, is what the Lord says. Jesus himself gave a little verse on covetousness. Luke 12, 15, he said, Take heed, be careful, watch out, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things they possess. Now that's a tough one. Hard word from Jesus Christ. Because we're taught all of our lives that our life does consist in what we possess. It's the house we live in, the car we drive, the income that we make at work, the, the title that we carry at the institution where we work. All of these things we are taught is what makes us to be who we are and gives us our status. And you know what? I didn't come up with this. God says nonsense. That's not who you are. Beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of things that you possess. It's somewhere else. I've heard one pastor say that coveting, the sin of coveting, is not being content unless you have something other than Christ. That's the sin. Christ is everything Christ can fill your heart, satisfy your soul, give you contentment. And when you're coveting something materially, what you're doing is you're saying that Christ, that's not good enough for me. I'm different. Something other than Christ. <coughs> Think about that. Keep that to heart. Now, I kind of warned you last week that as we finished the Ten Commandments, I wanted to sort of bring it all together. Uh, I've been really kind of anxious to do this because... I've said some things that might have been surprises to some of you during the series about the Ten Commandments. Now, uh, I'm, just, I'm just going to give it to you flat out. They're still in effect. One of them's been seriously changed. Three of them have been taken deep into your heart. But they're still in effect, but they're written in your heart now instead of on a tablet of stone. And I'm going to show you where that comes from. Uh, Theologians, great learned men, have studied the scriptures for hundreds of years now, and they have concluded, that when you study the Old and the New Testament, that the law, and I'm speaking of the Ten Commandments here, the law was given by God, number one, it teaches in the Bible, to restrain wickedness. God sets boundaries. There will be no killing among you, no murder, no stealing. It's to restrain wickedness. Number two, everybody understands the Ten Commandments were given to, to show us that we're guilty and we need a Savior. When you witness to somebody, when I do, 
I always start with Romans 3.23 for all sin and come short of the glory of God. And uh, people will agree with that. If they don't agree with that, you start listing the Ten Commandments. And you don't have to go very far before everybody will say, well, yeah, I've done that. I've done that one. And therefore, we all are sinners. And the law was given to us by God to show us our guilt and lead us to Jesus Christ. But there's a third reason that we have the law. And it's the most important one of all. The Ten Commandments were given to show us what God's like. They are given to show us what the character of our God is. If you could all be transported at this moment to, to heaven, and you could be before his throne and have that conversation I know you all long to have, you're going to find out when you begin to talk one-on-one -on -one personally with our God that his character is revealed through the Ten Commandments. That's the kind of life that he lives. That's what's in his heart. And he gave it to us to show us what his character is like. You know, Paul said, Romans 6.14, Sin will have no dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. We understand that? Are we clear about that? We do not keep the law in order to be saved. That's over. That ended at the cross of Calvary. We are clear about that. Romans 7, 6, we've now been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Once again, Paul is saying the Ten Commandments had a roll back yonder in the Old Testament, but it's gone. It's been set aside after Jesus died on the cross. But, Paul turns right around and in Romans 3.31, he says, do, they, do, them, do we make void the law through our faith in Christ? He said, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Now, all I'm saying is that things have changed. We're living in a new time now. In the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the law had a different purpose. To bring us to Christ. To show us that we're sinners. To show us what God's like. But then He came and He died on the cross as a substitute for our sin and He rose from the dead. And when He did, He told us to go into all the nations and preach the gospel baptizing people and telling them to be baptized in his name. Things have changed. It's new. That's why they call it the new covenant. But those ten commandments are still there. But they're different now. They've been changed. What they do for us now. Now, as Christian, it's primarily to show you what God's like. To show you what his character is like. You know, it's interesting I know you know the story about the rich young ruler. You can find it in Mark chapter 10. The conversation Jesus had with the rich young ruler. And uh, he said to this young man, Good teacher, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? Jesus said, What are you calling me good for? No one is good but one, and that is God. Now look, look you hear what he does. He quotes the Ten Commandments. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And the young man said to Jesus, Teacher, all these things I've kept since my youth. And Jesus looked at him and he loved him and he said, One thing do you lack. Go and sell whatever you have and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Take up your cross and follow me. One thing, not ten things. Until Christ came, there were ten things, the Ten Commandments. And when the Jews would judge a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, it would be based on the Ten Commandments, on the law. But that's over. Jesus quoted the Ten Commandments to him, and then he turned right around, and he said, you lack one thing. You need to take up your cross and follow me. That's the one 
thing in place of the ten things. The Ten Commandments are still out there, but they have been put into a new role. They're not the same as they were before Jesus came. If you go back there in the book of Exodus and you go to chapter 20 and you read about the list of the, of the uh, Ten Commandments, or you could go over to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5 and you can read the list of the Ten Commandments. If you go back there and you read a few chapters before to what led up to that day at Mount Sinai when God wrote them out for him, the interesting thing is you get into a little bit of history. And if, what we find out is the Ten Commandments were given after God saved them. He brought them out of Egypt, led them through the wilderness to Mount Sinai, and gave them the Ten Commandments. Saved the law. That's the order that things happen in. He didn't give them the Ten Commandments first while they're down in Egypt and make them saved and then lead them out through the wilderness to Mount Sinai. You see the, the order of things? Well, that's the way it is today for us. Those of you that have accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you have been saved. You've been born anew, born from above. So here you are, a new creation in Christ, and secondly comes the Ten Commandments to show us what the character of God is. It's just like in the Old Testament. The same order. Salvation and deliverance and then commandments. How to live. How do we act? When I studied this, I found that the Ten Commandments are present in the New Testament. And I wasn't really surprised at that. I uh, had some questions about some of them, but they're still in the New Testament. For instance, the first commandment, what is it? You shall have no other gods before me, right? No more. There's no polytheism anymore. There's me. One God. Well, Acts 4.12, you know it. Nor is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's the first commandment. There's only one God, and his name is Jesus. So it's present in the New Testament. It was reaffirmed in the New Testament. Second commandment, you shall not make unto yourselves any graven images. It's there in the New Testament, Colossians 1.15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. All things were created for him and through him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's the second commandment. There are no images for Christian people we're not making graven images today. We're not making idols to Baal or Ashtaroth or Che Guevara or Fidel Castro or anything. It's the image of the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to us through the Scripture and through Calvary that has replaced the second commandment or rather opened it up and told us its true intent. Number three, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain, it says in the Old Testament. Philippians 2.10 That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're taught in the New Testament the third commandment, and it's the name of Jesus one more time. We're taught that prophetically speaking, there's coming a day when the trumpet blows and everyone that is alive will either spontaneously, willingly say the name of Jesus Christ or they will feel a compulsion, irresistible, 
to draw them to their knees where they will against their will confess that Jesus is Lord. The third commandment is going, is, and will be in effect, and it's going to be in Jesus Christ and no other. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I've spent more time on this one than I have any other one, and it was because there is a change that takes place here, and it's not really more severe or any different from the changes that happened to the other nine commandments, but it's significant. Jesus, Matthew 12, 5. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath, and they're blameless for it? Yet I say to you that in this place there's one greater than the temple. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Now listen, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath. We're taught that Christ is the Creator. When you read Genesis 1 and it says, The Lord spoke and separated the light from the darkness. We're talking about Jesus Christ. He is Lord of the Sabbath. He created it. He is superior to it. Now the significant thing, most Christian people worship today on Sunday. They don't on Saturday. In Judaism, it's still on uh, Saturday, their, their Sabbath day. On, uh, we have a couple of pretty significantly sized groups in the United States that worship on Saturday. But the thing that strikes me is very early, very early in church history, Christians change from Saturday to Sunday. To them, that was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And in Revelation 1.10, written by the Apostle John, the generation, the compadre, the good friend of Jesus Christ, the Apostle John wrote, I was in the Spirit when? On the Lord's Day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now, what that reveals is that in the lifetime of Christ, his contemporary, John the, John the Apostle, was revealing it was already an established institution for Christians to worship on Sunday. They'd changed. He was a Jew. He was a man that uh, when the resurrection happened was there he witnessed it. He saw the risen Christ with the other apostles. And early on in church history, they had changed already where the Lord's Day was Sunday. Before this time, it would have been a Saturday. So a change happened. But I'll tell you what convinced me the most. When I say convinced, I, I'm, what I'm alluding to is a change has happened. For, you know, it's just flat out happened. Uh, I read you verses last week in Colossians where Paul talks about the Sabbath. But here's, here's the one that really grips me, and it's found in the book of Hebrews. What the Sabbath has become now, the rest of the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, the Sabbath, what it has become now is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. People that are saved, that have accepted Christ and turned from their sins and have been born anew by the Holy Spirit, have entered into God's rest and into His Sabbath. Now, let me, let me read this, and then we'll talk about it. Hebrews 4.1 Therefore, since a promise remains of entering into His rest, lest us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard, he's talking about the Old Testament Jews, it did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. 
For we who have believed do enter into that rest, he's talking about the Sabbath, as he has said. And here's a quotation from the Old Testament. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. He's talking about those that did not believe when the Messiah came. Verse 4, For he spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. He's talking about quotes from the Old Testament. Verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter it because of disobedience, that's the Jewish people, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, I don't know if you caught it or not, but what Paul just said, well, I say Paul, but they, don't, they don't really believe Paul wrote Hebrews anymore, but uh, whoever wrote it, what he said was that in the Old Testament, keeping the Sabbath was an observance of rest on the seventh day. That's what it was. But now, notice what he ties it to. Those that enter the rest and those that observe the true Sabbath are those that have accepted Jesus Christ as the only Lord and Savior. He quoted, Paul said, the ones that get it are those that say today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. That's an invitation. That's a, that's a verse you've heard a million times in invitations by preachers, haven't you? You heard him say it? Today, I know some of you out there, you hear the Holy Spirit calling you, don't harden your hearts, come on down here and let some of us pray with you and share with you the scriptures. Today, if you hear that voice, don't harden your heart. That's a gospel call. That's a call to salvation. It's a call to come to Jesus. And Paul is saying that is what has replaced the Sabbath day of the Old Testament. Because why? Because people that come to Jesus and are saved enter into the rest of God. We have rest. We have eternal security. We have the knowledge that should we die today that we will go to heaven. That's Sabbath rest. And it's, it's striking that Paul, or whoever wrote this book, was so clear, so clear, that this commandment has been changed, just like the other ones I told you. It's been fulfilled, and it's been revealed, and it's been deepened and made personal. Now, the fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother. And I went to great lengths when we had this commandment a couple of weeks ago to tell you that no one kept this commandment better than Jesus. He honored Mary and Joseph. We've got record of it in the scriptures. He walked away from the temple when they lost him and honored them and went home with them. He turned water into wine at Cana when, when Mary asked him to. It didn't really seem like he wanted to, but he did it for his mother. He turned her over to John to, so that he could take care of her when he died on the cross. Jesus fulfills the fifth commandment in the, in the New Testament perfectly. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit murder. Now notice, remember, it does not say thou shalt not kill. The King James Bible says that, and it's wrong. The word correctly rendered is you shall not murder. We have that repeatedly reinforced in the New Testament. Read Romans 13, verses 1 through 10, anytime you please and you'll find out that commandment is still in effect. Murder is a sin. It's wrong. It's wrong in our country. It's wrong in every country. Almost in the world that I know of, I can't think of an exception, it has been codified into law, and it came from the finger of God writing on a stone tablet. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Seventh commandment. 
Can anyone tell me that we don't have laws about that? Has that been done away with? Certainly not. No, to violate the marriage contract and to have relations with someone else other than the, the bride or the husband that you've been given, it's wrong. It violates our civil law, but it violates the law of God. But the New Testament affirms this commandment. Jesus' treatment of the woman that was caught in adultery shows us that. He said, don't do this anymore. Go and sin no more, right? He didn't say that adultery has been done away with, did he? He said, just don't do that anymore. Ephesians 5.25 teaches us that you, you are now the bride of Christ. That's one of your names. Now, I know some of you guys are saying, I don't like it. But it's okay. It's a metaphor. It, it's saying that we have been wed to Christ. And the New Testament uses that imagery a lot of times. Ephesians 5.25 said, Just as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. That's you. Boys and girls are going to be presented to Christ as his bride when we all get to heaven. It's an image to keep in your mind, well, what happens if I walk out of it here today flat-footed and, and, and go out and just send my little heart out all week long? I'm committing spiritual adultery because I've been wed to Christ. And you are too. And to violate that covenant between Christ is the same thing as a husband that commits adultery against his wife. It's just as serious, and it's still in effect, this commandment. You shall not steal is the Eighth Commandment. You remember that lady, Sephiroth? Sephiroth? I'm getting tongue tied. In the book of Acts, her and her husband sold their land and decided to kind of trick the apostles, and, uh, and they did, but they fell down dead. They were stealing from the Lord. You know, the Scripture teaches they could have kept that uh, money, all of it, if they wanted to. It was just that they made a vow, a solemn vow, and lied about how much they got for the land and how much they had to give to the Lord. And so they were punished for it. Thou shalt not steal is still in effect. I don't know anyone, any society, anywhere at any time that has not had a law about stealing. This commandment is still in effect. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And we just talked about this one this morning. It's wrong to lie, to libel, to slander, uh, to say wrong things about your neighbor, about some other person. It's just wrong. It's wrong in the eyes of God, and it's wrong in the eyes of our courts. We've got all sorts of lies about this one. And uh, John 1, 17, the law was given through Moses, but he's talking about the Ten Commandments. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. When I say that I'm a Christian, it means that I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to bear false witness. Still in effect. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or belongings, his animals, anything that's your neighbor's. Coveting, as I said, reveals a heart in us that says Jesus is not enough. He's not enough. I've got to have what she's got. If I had, if I had what he has, I'd be happy. Coveting says that Jesus is not sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12.9, Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest on me. Paul understood that to be content, that Jesus had to be everything to him. We've got a, about a four or five week time that we spend looking at the Ten Commandments. Now, I've pretty well on purpose not gone into 
the attack on the Ten Commandments in our country. Uh, I want to try just to say a brief word about that before we close today. Uh, do all of y'all know who Judge Roy Moore is in Alabama? A uh, former Supreme Court judge in Alabama that was ordered to take a, a monument to the Ten Commandments off of the state property. And he's running for United States Senator right now. I think his election's coming up this month. He's only one of many. Uh, Oklahoma, just this last year, had a monument to the Ten Commandments that was ordered, torn down. It's happened all over the country. I bet many of you can remember when you went to school that your school had a copy of the Ten Commandments, if not in your classroom, in the hallway when you came in. The Supreme Court of the United States in Washington, D.C., you have to go by three displays of the Ten Commandments before you get to the courtroom. Isn't that striking? I believe that what we're witnessing today is what the Bible refers to as antinomian. And I went into this briefly when we started this. It means against law, rebellion against law, no law. There's no restraint. And our society, many in it, are desiring to be able to have a place, just like in the book of Judges, where it said everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And friends, as enticing as that sounds, you don't want to go there. You do not want to live in a society like that. God gave us the Ten Commandments to restrain our wickedness, to teach us that we're sinners and that we need Christ, and then to show us what God's like in His heart. To show us what kind of heart He's got. Those Ten Commandments reveal His character. Well, the blessed thing is, this is really neat, and Pastor Mike's been preaching on it, uh, about Jeremiah 31. I want to close with reading it one more time to you, and I want you to think about you, your, your, your life since you accepted Christ when I read this, okay? Just think about it. Jeremiah 31, 31. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, even though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but here, okay, this is the covenant that I will make. I will put my laws in their minds, and I'm going to write it on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. Now, that's the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament radically changed. In that, when you came to Christ and you bowed your knee to Him, something happened. A lot, a lot of things happened. But one of the things that happened was God wrote His law on your heart and He put it in your mind. That's the basis for our life in Christ today. Now, I'm speaking as a Christian. I can't say that that's true about those in our country that are lost. It hasn't happened to them yet. People that are lost have not got the law, which is the Ten Commandments in this case, written on their hearts or in their minds. And that's why they act the way they do. They're, they're just acting out things the way they think it ought to be themselves. And yet you... Since the day you came to Christ, through the Holy Spirit's work in your heart and in your mind, you've been changed. You're living out God's character in this generation. So it's important, it's very important that we resist this move in our country to become a, a country that's secular, a country that is not based on Christian commandments, a country that is that is uh, where people can just do whatever they want to do. They call it freedom, and it's called rebellion in the scriptures. And it's going to lead to destruction. It will. The Ten Commandments are still important. 
Nobody gets saved by them anymore. But what kind of life, what kind of country, what kind of people have got a problem with little children being told it's wrong to murder and it's wrong to steal and it's wrong to commit adultery? What kind of country would not want their children to hear commandments like that from the Lord God Almighty? Well, that's the country you live in. And I'm sad. I'm sad about it. Uh, we've got a lot of praying to do and a lot of work to do. Um, this path that we're trying to go down is not the right one. And I, I hope that this series on the Ten Commandments has been a help to you. And as I said, next week we'll start the uh, book of Hebrews, if you want to kind of get ahead of me there a little bit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scripture. We thank you for the lessons of the Ten Commandments and their place that you gave them to us. Uh, you've opened them up and fulfilled them to us in the New Testament and showed us your true intent. But most of all, Lord, we remember what we were like before we knew Jesus. We remember the rebellion and sin that was in our hearts when we did not have your law written on our hearts and minds. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done uh, to write those in our hearts and our minds and give us a way to, uh, to live them out of this world. Uh, you're good to us, Lord. You're very good. You're kind. In Jesus' name, amen.